Uh, salutations, tubers. Welcome back to the layout room. This time I should be doing a brief little history of video, sort of kind of like in the vein of my previous series on steam locomotive wheel arrangement, but, but this time we shall be covering the evolution of passenger equipment using the models in the collection. Uh, so I guess without further ado, you'll notice the two cars sitting ahead on the track and you're thinking, hey, wait a second, these aren't passenger cars, what do, what do you mean? Well, in the very beginning of the railway, back circa 1820, 1830, there were no passenger cars. The first, the, uh, first passenger cars were actually little more than buckets on rails, and they were made for carrying freight, like stone or coal, bulk goods. And somebody got the bright spark, got so excited by seeing this steam engine pulling along, they jumped on top of the loads and rode on top of the cars. And uh, very crude. This is actually a later car, but it uh, represents the sort of cars that were in use back in the 1830s. Uh, very crude, no suspension, or if they had suspension at all, they were very, you know, uh, leaf springs made by a blacksmith. Very rough ride, but then again, the locomotives of the time didn't go very fast. So the whole climbing on top of the freight wouldn't do. So the bright sparks on the railway management thought, hmm, there's money to be made doing this. So they took cars like this. This is, again, a later car, but it's a pretty good representation of an open truck that would have been used back in the time. This one's, I actually think, from about the 1940s-ish, but it serves our purposes. So what they would do is they would cut openings in the side of the car to put doors into, and then inside they'd put little bench seats, kind of like church pews. I mean, all well and good, but one of the big drawbacks was you're out in the open, you're exposed. I mean, if it's a sunny day, eh, it might be pretty pleasant, but um, if it gets bad, you know, you have no protection from the elements. And back in the day, I've heard more than one story of contemporary accounts where the ladies in their frilly dresses and stuff, the hot cinders and sparks from the engine would fly out and catch on their clothes and catch their clothes on fire. So obviously this was not going to do for the well-to-do people of that time. So they came up with the idea of getting a flat wagon, something kind of like this, this crude little truck drawing I made particularly with this car here on the left, and basically make little stagecoaches on rails. So basically, it would be like a horseless carriage that you'd see running around on the street, but they just put it on a little railway wagon, and that would be your passenger car. Of course, that was only for the well-to-do folks. If you were poor, you might still be in an open car, or a car like this, they'd have a little uh, canopy above it to help protect you somewhat, but even so, it's kind of crude. And uh, no facilities to speak of. If you needed to, you know, answer a call of nature, you went and found a convenient bush or something. Of course, in back in the day, they used to carry on a tradition that all the old stagecoach drivers used to do and stop at Wayside Inn so the crew would have a bite to eat and get, get a little drink and, you know, take care of things. And uh, the railway management wasn't too keen on that. They used to pr very um, dry reprimands for crews for doing that. But, you know, you, you know, and the passengers, of course, would avail themselves of that. But this couldn't last forever. So moving on, shunt these out of the way. We move on about 30 years to about 1860, and we get what I would call proper railway coaches. These are, again, approximations. These are actually uh, redressed Thomas and Friends coaches, but they're of the right period. Uh, you notice we have a full-length car body. They're made of wood. We actually have suspension down on the wheels. It's still kind of crude by today's standards, but it worked. Um, these are usually single axle. They might be four-wheel or six-wheel. But this was kind of the style of the era. And on the inside, we have compartments. These would usually run the full width of the car body. 
And depending on the class of ticket you had, in third class things were kind of kind of bare. Second class a little more plush, and first class you had you know really plush. But still, the facilities were kind of lacking. You know, there's still no water closet, no toilet facilities. So if you need to go and you didn't go beforehand, which was kind of hard considering the stations didn't have bathrooms then, you were kind of out of luck. There used to be, shall we say, specialty purveyors for discreet means of uh, doing things on the fly. And you look at them, they look like something out of a Heath Robinson catalog or, you know, crazy invention series, but that's what you had to do. No food service for a while. Yeah, the next evolution was coaches like this. So moving right along, we have a coach from about 1850. This is actually a mail car, but coaches were made not too dissimilar to this. You'll see we have what are called bogeys. So we're not riding on the single axle anymore. So it's called a bogey coach. And we've got this flat roof. This was kind of a trademark of the early days. It's still made of wood, and we've got our tie irons down here. This basically holds the coach together, and it was often a favorite spot for hobos to ride, but they usually preferred to ride on freight trains. But that's something for another time. Uh, still kind of primitive. The seats were kind of still like church pews. No facilities. If you're lucky, you have a stove. In fact, that's what these little chimneys are for, is for the little wood-burning stove. I mean, if the weather wasn't too bad, I guess it would be a, a good ride. But uh, for any, any length of time in the winter, I mean, it usually tended to be warm over by the stove. But uh, everywhere else, you were freezing because they weren't insulated. Kind of crude. Still no facilities to speak of, though improvements were made. Uh, what you usually did back in these days when you wanted to eat, you'd stop somewhere and you'd go eat. Um, on the Santa Fe, they had the Harvey Houses, which was a bunch of establishments run by a chap called Fred Harvey. Served pretty good food. But by and large, you hear some of the accounts from the period of rail, rail side dining wasn't very good. So Fred Harvey worked real hard to try and change that. That's where we get the, the Harvey Girls movie is loosely tied into that. But, uh... And then moving along, we have slightly later cars still have appeared. This is about 1870. This is what's called a Clara Story coach. Because of the little windows up here, this is called a Clara Story. Same basic design. Made of wood. Heated by a little potbelly stoves, at least to start out with. Um, in the beginning, this kind of car was manually braked. But events such as the Armagh rail crash over in Ireland and other accidents that occurred over here in the United States quickly convinced lawmakers that you had to have continuous brakes. So the, the automatic air brake was eventually settled on. So these cars eventually would be retrofitted with air brakes. Uh, another bad thing that tended to happen back in this particular era was what was called telescoping. When these things get into an accident with wooden coaches, it's not like steel. It doesn't bend and twist and warp. With wood, it just shatters and splinters. So what would happen in an accident when a, car, when a wooden coach telescopes into another, one will force itself into the body of the other and split it open from the inside. So if you were unlucky enough to be in there, it was not a good time. Another thing that would happen would be the potbelly stoves would tump over and spill their contents all over the car. Well, since it's dry and made of wood with paint on it, it would catch a light very very quickly so train accidents used to be pretty darn horrific back in those days so very quickly it was decided the potbelly stove approach wasn't going to work so they tried putting little steam boilers in them and so on eventually it was decided to use radiators and pipe the steam directly from the engine and uh, these days, it's very, very rare to see wooden coaches like this. 
Uh, usually where you'll see them is in a museum or in a tourist operation. Uh, very few originals that still exist. I think I've seen a few out, out at Cumbrae's and Toltec, out on the narrow gauge. And some of the coaches on the Durango and Silverton are the original wood body coaches. But um, you can't use these in interchange service anymore because of accident risk. So moving right along. Next evolution of passenger car we have here, these are what are called heavyweight cars. And these cars are made out of steel. The changeover to steel happens circa 1900. I'd say these particular coaches are about mm, 1920s, maybe 1940s. But they continued using these all the way up till the end in some places. Uh, big difference, obviously, is that all the structural elements are made out of steel. You've got the big six-axle bogies, though there were eight-wheel bogies on heavyweight cars. And as you'll notice, we now have sleeping car. This is a Pullman car. Uh, Pullman actually got started back in the wood era, I'd say about 1870-ish. I'd have to go look up the exact dates. This is, this is just kind of a brief overview. But basically, they started out making sleeping cars back then. And kind of exported it to the world. But by the heavyweight era, Pullman was kind of getting into its own. They had uh, the berths, they had roomettes, that sort of thing. But the thing about Pullman was, those cars were privately owned. So if you see one on a train like this, the railroad has to pay the Pullman company for its use. So, uh, you, and as a passenger, you would have to pay a supplement on top of the regular train fare to use the sleeper car. I mean, this is a shortened consist. So, a real one, you might see about 12 cars, but I obviously don't have enough space to for have a 12-car heavyweight set. This is kind of a representative set of what a heavyweight train might look like. Uh, we've also got dining cars now. Another thing that started back in the wood era till the late bit on the wood era we no longer have to go to places like the harvey houses and wayside stations to get food you can now eat on the train uh, we've also got proper steam heating and air and in some cases steam air conditioning through steam jet cooling which is a little bit of a technical subject but very very cool no pun intended uh, we've got air brakes way way more comfortable than the old wooden cars. Um, don't know what else to really say, but I guess to just name the various types. I'm not going to go every single type there ever was, but just, just for reference, this is what's called a combination car. This hauls both baggage and mail and passengers. This is a regular coach. This is a Pullman sleeper. And this is an observation car. In some cases... Uh, railroads had little lounges in the back of the observation car. It was also a popular place to put the bars. So yeah, you know, obviously they serve booze. Very, very plush ride. And uh, you still see these from time to time as private cars. In fact, the uh, presidential car in the United States is an armored heavyweight. So this would be typically seen being pulled by steam engines and later on when the diesels came in. In fact, cars like these were why uh, early generations of diesels had steam generators in them because these cars were designed to use steam. So moving right along. Okay, next generation of passenger car. What's, what's called these days is the uh, streamliner cars. They started showing up in the 1930s with the experimental lightweight train sets like the uh, Pioneer Zephyr, which we have a representation of right here. With the 1700 Lionel Jr., this is the front and tail car of that. And uh, these cars, again, started in about the 1930s and lasted all the way up to the end of passenger service in some places, just like the heavyweights. Uh, biggest innovation is the materials used to construct them. 
They were made with stainless steel and aluminum, often made the walls load-bearing elements, so it made the cars a lot lighter. So in other words, you could pull a longer passenger train. I was watching a thing the other day. Old Pullman Porter worked back in those days. He said, well, on the old heavy cars, we only ever had 12 as our maximum load, but we could put 15 on lightweight. And in some places, we'd have to make a double stop because the train would be so far out in the boonies, and to get everybody on and off the train, we had to make a double stop. Uh, another big innovation to come in would be the dome car. Kind of an interesting story how these came about. It started out when an executive on the Western Pacific was riding with the crew of a freight train up in the cab of a F unit going through the Feather River Canyon, sat and thought, you know, it would be kind of neat if the passengers had a view like this. Got together with the design team and came up with the dome car. And we've got a super dome right here. Say it's a Milwaukee super dome just by looking at it, but different kettle of fish. Anyway, um, I've actually had the good fortune to ride in a dome car down in the Branson Scenic Railway. And if you ever have a chance to ride in one, do it because the view is absolutely spectacular. I mean, it's like looking through a big plexiglass bubble. I mean, you can see up and around and all over. Very, very comfortable ride. I was very, very impressed. Whole long way, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, why did we ever give this up? But anywho, anywho. Streamliner coaches. Okay, for our piece de resistance for our video, we have these. These are bi-level coaches, and these two happen to be Amtrak Superliners. But uh, I guess the first users of bi-level coaches that I'm aware of would be the Santa Fe. They had a set of bi-level passenger cars they used for the El Capitan few other of their passenger trains. Uh, the Chicago Northwestern used them in, in uh, commuter service. And there's places they're still using bi-level coaches for commuter service. Uh, very, very similar to streamliner coaches, in, but except that uh, instead of just one level, you have two. You've got the lower level and you've got the top level. And as for super liners, it can mean you have additional seating and the baggage space is down in here. So not quite as much need for a baggage car as there used to be, though they often still pull them. And for sleeping cars, you can have uh, big bedrooms in the showers down here and all the little roomettes and, and little cabins up in here. And on diners, you can have the uh, dining room in here and the kitchen down here. And they send the food up with little dumb waiters. But the big advantage of bi-level equipment is that you can carry more passengers in a given amount of space than you can with a single decker. Though one of the big downsides is clearance, particularly height clearance. This type of car can't be used on routes like the Northeast Corridor. And other routes in the Northeast because their tunnel clearances are small because they were designed for the smaller equipment that was used back in the day. Kind of harkens back to uh, what we said about articulated locomotives in the wheel notation video. There are some places that, you know, it just having a longer locomotive or a taller locomotive wouldn't work because the route was made for different equipment. Applies very much for rolling stock in, in as much as it does for locomotives. Uh, this particular kind of car you still see in service, still being used with Amtrak, though one day, as with so many other things, eventually they will probably be replaced. And uh, there we have it. I certainly hope you've enjoyed this brief little overview. If I missed something, screwed something up, or you want me to go into further detail, or you got another subject, Feel free to leave a message in the comments, and I'll make another video on it, I suppose. Very, very. Pr I will add, I'm very, very proud of my passenger equipment. It takes a little bit more work to get this kind of model than it does with uh, the freight equipment. But also, I'm kind of glad I have a little bit of everything.
from all the different arrows. It means I have more flexibility, what kind of trains I can run. But yeah, till next time, guys.